I have been following trends uh, first for as a journalist, then as an analyst for uh, the government for a number of years, and then um, as a researcher. What I do, what I'm interested in, is the nature of consciousness. And I'm an experimentalist. Um, I do. Uh, I have done a number of. Uh, studies of various kinds in remote viewing and creativity. Uh, the most recent one I did was on applied kinesiology, the muscle testing technique that many people use. Um, and I am also interested in how individual consciousness um, links together and creates uh, mass phenomena and creates social change. And my particular interest at the moment is how individuals and small groups change history for the good. And I focus on that because I think that there is a growing and stronger and stronger need for that. My view is that, which arises from my view of consciousness. Um, the part of consciousness that I'm interested in, I'm interested in all of it, but uh, the part that I am particularly interested in is called non-local consciousness. That is, it is that aspect of us which uh, is not limited by space and time. It is the part of us that has the near-death experience. It is the part of us that we open to in meditation. It is the part of us that we are... Uh, that we contact when we send healing intention to another. It is also the part of us that, um, that has moments of genius or that has religious epiphanies, spiritual epiphanies, or that just uh, has a déjà vu experience or a precognition, a, a premonition about something. Sometimes we call it a gut hunch or a woman's intuition. But in all cases, what this is, is opening to this aspect of ourselves, um, which is not limited by the domain of space and time. Now, we don't know very much about this. Um, I could probably write all the things we're absolutely sure about on the back of an envelope. But we do know a few things. And we are beginning to know more. Uh, if you look at the literature of science now, whether you look in quantum biology or quantum mechanics or parapsychology or in uh, uh, complementary medicine or a whole host of scientific disciplines, you will see emerging papers from many different directions all of which are describing this aspect of consciousness, the non-local. Up until about 300 years ago, uh, maybe 500 years ago, we'll go to Gal at Galileo, we'll start with that. Up until about 500 years ago, the only way you could think about these experiences was in religious terms or spiritual terms. <laughs> And for many people, that is still true. That is the context in which they have the experience. But in the last, particularly the last 50 years, we have begun to understand a little bit about how this, this aspect of consciousness operates. And in that process, we have come to realize, or at least let me just speak for myself, I have come to to realize and to believe that moments of genius, religious epiphany, and psychic experiences are all the same thing modulated by context and intention. That is, the, the physicist who's seeking to understand a deep principle, that's the kind of experience he has. The uh, uh, religious pilgrim is trying to have a God experience, that's the kind of experience they have. A remote viewer, uh, which is a technique that I am one of the developers of, 
uh, in which people describe persons, places, and events from which they are separated by either reason of time or space. They're, they're blinded to it. Or where the target isn't even selected <coughs> until after the data has been collected. All three of those experiences, when you talk to the people who have the experiences, they all report the same thing. When Brahms says, I'm in an altered state of consciousness, and in that altered state, I hear the music. I write it down. Or Mozart, or Copeland. When Picasso said, I look at the canvas until I see the picture, and then I paint it. I can do it very quickly. Or Michelangelo said, I look at the marble until I see the statue, and then I just take away everything that's not the statue. Or Tesla says, I was walking across Central Park when I had a vision and I could see the electric motor. And I went back to my laboratory and I quickly drew down the diagrams of how to make it and had someone make it and it ran. All of these kinds of things, and there are hundreds of these stories. I just <laughs> finished reading, I've been reading about a, a, a very famous mathematician named Ramanushan. Ramanujan. Ramanujan lived at the beginning of the last century, died um, quite young in, uh, in England where he was taken up by English mathematicians. And he said over and over to them, although they never understood it and, and treated it with either disdain or incomprehension, that all of his mathematical insights, he had no mathematical training at all, all of these extremely advanced mathematical insights, and people are still trying to figure out what he saw and, and to understand what he was saying. He said he got them all from the, he was being a Hindu, from a, a Brahmin from the goddess. Or he saw them, he, he just, they appeared in his mind in their crystalline perfection, and he wrote them down. If you've ever had a, a, um, a deja vu or a precognitive dream or a gut hunch, which later turned out to be correct, those sorts of things, that's, that's what we're talking about here. This is a normal part of being a human being. It isn't anomalous. It isn't something that you get. It's nothing that's coming from outside of you, although that's the way it may be experienced and that people talk about it. But this is a part of being a human being. And what this research is all telling us collectively is that all life is interconnected and interdependent. So when we think about the choices that we make, we need to recognize that our choice is a vote for all life. <clears throat> and the choices that we make either are life affirming or life denying. <laughs> Thank you. When you said before that it comes from within and not from without, is it something that's trainable? Is it something that everybody's gifted with? Is it something, since you've developed skills within remote viewing, I was wondering if you could speak to the qualities which make one either better skilled at it, better able to learn or work with it. What are some of the dimensions for whether it be remote viewing, whether it be listening to intuition, whether it be distant sure. time space? Could you speak to that? Well, first of all, everybody can do this. It's a part of being a human being. And in fact, it's a part of being alive. All organisms can do it. There are studies ranging from single cells all the way up to high order mammals that show this. This is a part of who we are. There are certain things that you can do to learn to open to this part of yourself. It is a function of focus. Is, is an expression of intention that you wish to do it, 
And you have to develop some form of inward lookingness as a technique. Um, it is spread through the population, so far as we can tell, very much like all other human abilities. That is, there are some people, you know, it's a bell curve. They call it a bell curve because it looks sort of like a bell. And there are some people at this end who are really gifted. And there's some people at this end who either cannot or will not give themselves permission to have the experience. <coughs> and most of us fall somewhere in the middle. There are two components to it. You have an innate ability, and that's just the ability that you incarnated with. And the second component is that you must, as with any human skill, you must develop a discipline for expressing it. Now, there are all kinds of ways to do this, and it is one of the tragedies of the spiritual quest that it got tied up with religion and dogmatism. Because there is no one path up the mountain. In fact, the mountain's an illusion. So how you get up it is purely a matter of personal taste and style. We know from the experimental research that the single defining characteristic of people who are good at this is that they're meditators. If it were in my power to, to um, wave a magic wand, I would train all children in what I would call psychophysical self-regulation, because meditation alarms some people. They, you know, it has images of fakirs and strange people in bed sheets, and it alarms them. So, psychophysical self-regulation. <laughs> but I would teach all children at the time that they learn the Pledge of Allegiance the rudiments of a contemplative discipline. Because the outcome studies that have been done, and there are about 1,500, a little over 1,500, 1,587, I think, was the last time I looked, uh, papers in the peer-reviewed literature on meditation. If you do a Google on PubMed or Scopus or one of those, that'll come up. There's literally thousands of these papers. And what they tell us is, is that developing this technique of focusing intentioned awareness makes you sleep better makes you more creative, lowers your stress levels, gives you a better sex life, makes you better able to focus in your work, makes you more responsive to your relationships, and on and on and on and on. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of these papers that show over and over again that developing a technique for inward lookingness of expressing focused intention contemplatively is probably the single most important skill you develop because it allows you to handle the stresses of life and to become a better partner in your relationships and to be more productive in your work. Now, that said, there are hundreds of ways to do this. I've developed a way that's specifically designed for modern minds, but there are hundreds of these things. There are ancient ones that go back thousands of years. There are Native American techniques. There are Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, Sufi, whatever. There are every it is one of the universals of all religious paths 
that within that path there is some subset, whether it's the Sufis in Islam, the Kabbalists in Judaism, the Johannine Christians in Christianity, there is within all of those broad spiritual rivers some subset of people who develop this inward technique of opening themselves to the non-local. And, and what I would call the non-local, others might call spiritual, uh, some would call creative, but it is this aspect which connects us. Metaphorically, you might think of it as a kind of internet in which we are all workstations, we all have our little PCs, and we don't communicate PC to PC, we communicate PC to net to PC. And this is just a metaphor. But we are all linked in this. When we send healing to someone, what we are sending is not energy. Nothing goes out of us. What we are doing is linking with the recipient at the non-local level and standing intercessor with them to help them awaken their own capacity for healing. In a sense, healing is a kind of non-locally stimulated placebo effect. You know, one of the great mysterious islands of science is the placebo effect. It's in every, it is the gold standard for every drug trial. And we, when you read these studies or you hear people talk about it on the television, they'll say, oh yes, well this was a placebo controlled blah blah blah. But nobody seems to get is that if you look across all these placebo studies, on average 35% of the people who get the sugar pill do as well or better than the people who get the medication. And in fact, in, in, in drugs used in psychiatry, <clears throat> the differential between the placebo effect and the drug effect has been decreasing. As they advertise the drugs, people understand what they're about and so when they participate in the trials, they know what this drug is supposed to do and they manifest the effect. <laughs> I mean, really, you stay with this for a minute. 35% on average across all these trials do as well or better than the people that get the medication. Now, if I announced tonight that I was going to do a pancreas study, I suspect, this audience being uh, highly educated, um, even so, it would not surprise me if a majority of people did not know where their pancreas was. <laughs> it is, in fact, in those pictures you see of the stomach where it has that little sort of loop, that's where the pancreas fits. But they don't know where it is. Most people don't know where their pancreas is, and they don't know what it does. And yet, if you were a participant in a placebo drug trial for the pancreas, 35% of you would do as well or better than the people who got the medication. How can that be? How do they know where it is? How do they know to turn it on? <laughs> How do they know what effect is being desired? The answer is, is that in non-local consciousness, there are no secrets. There is no blindness. <laughs> Everything is available. This is what Jung called the collective unconscious. This is what in Eastern traditions is called the Akashic record. This is what uh, great clairvoyants like Edgar Cayce called the collective soul mind, Steiner, Gurdjieff, 
Blavatsky, Uspensky, all kinds of people through the course of history have had an experience with this part of themselves. And what these, the reason placebo is important is that what it's telling us is that we have the ability to control our bodily function down to the cellular level. A thought is a thing. And therefore the mind-body connection has a terrifically important aspect function in our health and well-being. And so it's important to be mindful of that and to support those things which are compassionate and life-affirming and not to give countenance to those things which are death-oriented and destructive of life. And they're all around us. It has to do with the movies you choose, stimulus that you see, all this stuff, we get to make choices. And one of the most important things that I hope I will leave you with tonight, and we can get into this in some detail, is the idea that individual choice, individual choice, little things, are what matter. Yeah, they don't seem that way. Oh, I'm just an ordinary person. What difference does it make what I do about my light bulbs? If you fly over the, if you fly over between the United States and Canada, there's no hard line that says this is Canada and this is United States, or further down that this is Mexico and this is the United States. There's no line that you look down out of the plane and see there's some sort of and yet, people 50 feet on either side of that utterly arbitrary border have no question whether they're Americans or Mexicans or Americans or Canadians. What is the difference? 99.5% of our genetic material is exactly the same. Things like skin color are such an inconsequential part of, of our genetic makeup that they hardly bear mentioning. And yet, how do we know we're a Mexican or an American or a Canadian? And the answer is that we make thousands and thousands of tiny little choices. What we eat, what sports we watch, what music we listen to, what flag we stand up for how we raise our children, how we worship, the instruments that we use to eat, the foods we choose to eat. All of those things in aggregate create our national character. It is an expression of the beingness of all of us. And if we want to change it, we must change our beingness. So part of what brought me to the interest in this was I was a student at uh, Jay-Z school, uh, Grandpa School. And and it was all about the development of the power of choice and mind, what you expose yourself to, what thoughts you have, and how that influenced the body-mind. But the other thing that I really experienced was the beyond the extraordinary. In other words, the capability of the Tibetan meditators and their, their physiological responses that could, they could create, the ability to see future words, the ability to see things that we consider truly extraordinary and paranormal and outside the norm set. And I think that our culture has said that those things really don't happen really. Could you speak to, as people that you've been in a population with, that see the extraordinary as possible, how does that start to affect their lives that that does become the norm? And could you speak to that transition, of maybe for yourself, once you saw that these kinds of things are possible, seeing into your own future, being able to diagnose on the spot, being able to travel distant places. Once the extraordinary became your norm, how did that change your life and your experience with others like that? Well, I, uh, I, uh, um, I've been accumulating for a while and actually I'm considering putting a book together on this, Waking Up Stories. I suspect if we went around the room here tonight that a considerable percentage of the audience would have a waking up story. 
and they would recognize it as that. I mean, they wouldn't be unclear about it. They would recognize it as a waking up story. That before that, they saw the world one way, and after that, they saw the world another way. It's not one thing. It's a, it, it, it begins a path, but it's a threshold experience. And your life is on one side of the threshold, and then something happens, and it's on the other side of the threshold. Just out of curiosity, how many people have waking up stories? Yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> it's, it, that's an extraordinary experience. It is, by the way, um, uh, I, I doubt that I have a lot of fundamentalists in the audience tonight, but the born-again experience is a variant of the waking up story. It just depends on the context in which you wake up. But this idea, the waking up process, um, opens for you all kinds of possibilities. Now, if your waking up experience falls within religious dogma, then it's limited by that dogmatic experience, or that dogmatic uh, uh, theology. If you wake up as much of South Whidbey would, or did, uh, as really sort of social progressives, then it, ha it opens a whole other set of options that arise. But the thing that comes up that's common to all of them is the sense of connectedness with a greater whole, a sense that you are in interaction with something larger than yourself, a sense that through that connection lies your personal development. And it leads to a whole series of choices. Uh, just for reasons that I don't quite understand, let me just leave it at that, I have been able to meet almost every major consciousness teacher, researcher, guru, whatever, over the last 50 years. Some of them I've gotten to know very well. And I have, in the course of that, seen some fairly extraordinary things. I'll just tell you two short stories, to, uh, two quick stories to illustrate it. I was taken out into the, I was, I was in Egypt, and I was, I wanted to do uh, a series of archaeological digs in the city of Alexandria, which was one of the great cities of the classical world, in search of Alexander's tomb and Cleopatra's palace and Mark Anthony's palace. And I was going to do this, or I did this, uh, by using remote viewing. As I described earlier, remote viewing is an ability to describe persons, places, objects, or events from which you are separated by reason of time or space. And in this case, I had had people in all scattered all over the world marked down on maps where they thought these things were located, and, and then I had done an analysis process and had arrived at what I believed were the consensual judgments of all of these viewers. And so I was... Um, I had gone to Egypt, and in order to get the permission from the government to do this, I was challenged to do a demonstration. And I had with me um, two people, a woman named Hella Hamid, who was an internationally known fine arts photographer, and a typical Canadian working class man named George McMullen from Nanaimo. So this group of archaeologists who were beyond skeptical, they, they were overtly hostile, <laughs> said to me, we want you to locate a building in the middle of the desert that is buried, we don't know where it is, and we want you to locate a building that has a mosaic floor. 
not just any building, you know, any <laughs> building in a... So in an area of about 1,500 square kilometers, which they took us out to, um, 1,500 square kilometers, it would be about the size of Whidbey, I guess. Pretty, maybe not all of Whidbey, but a lot of Whidbey. So they, they took us out to the edge of this area, and they said, now, okay, well, this is all filmed, by the way, and, um, okay, we want you to locate this building. And so George McMullen and I sort of walked out into the desert. And George was a, was, I had met George through a man named Norman Emerson, who was the president and founder of Canadian archaeology, was then the president of the Archaeological Society, was a professor at Toronto. And um, so George and I walked out, and we walked around for a while, and I said, George, can you do this? He said, oh, yeah, I can do this. <laughs> so we, after a couple of hours, he said, okay, I know where I want to go. And he walked back over to where this Egyptian archaeologist was waiting, and he knelt down in the sand, and he said, okay, this is, this is where you all have been working, and that's where I want to go, but I want to go next to that. I don't want to go there. I want to go over here. And this man kind of, his eyes widened. His pupils dilated. He said, "Yes, yes, that's that's true. We, we we were working there, but you know, I don't know what he thought. Anyway, so we all piled into the cars, and with George saying, "Turn left, turn right, turn left, turn right," we drove. I don't know about 15 miles, and and uh, and George said, "Stop." And he got out of the car, and and with the film crew and myself, and and trailed by this whole bunch of archaeologists. And we walked out into the desert, and it's a desert, you know, it looked, well, if you've ever driven from Los Angeles to Palm Springs, that's what it looked like. <laughs> and George walked along for a little while, and then he said, okay. Now, to me, it looked just like everything else. He said, it's right here, and uh, I had a bag of steaks. And so I said, oh, okay, George, uh, all right, we'll mark this. And, this is before GPS. So we, we took George away, and then we brought Hella out. We did the whole thing over again, and she, she picked the same spot. And so, uh, so then I brought George back, and, and, and I said, George, I got this bag of steaks, and what I want you to do is to stake out the corners. Now think about that for a minute. This is something that's buried four or five feet under the ground, and I want, the, I want to know where the corners are. He said, okay, no problem. I'll even give you a door. <laughs> so he did. He put the stakes down where he said the corners were. And, and um, then he went away, and we brought Hella back. And I said, this is where George has staked it out. Now I want you to look down through the ground, and I want you to tell me what you see. Now, they don't actually look through the ground. They go into non-local consciousness, where all this information is. Everything is in non-local. And Hella looked at it, and she said, oh, well, you know, I think George is right. Uh, there's three rooms, and oh, there's this, there's this kind of clay column that, that's in the, in, they knocked a hole in the wall between two rooms, and they built this clay column, and it's there. And, um, okay, and I, so I went over and I told this archaeologist all this. He just thought it was absolute nonsense. Because the uh, University of Guelph in Canada had, unbeknownst to me at the time, had previously surveyed the whole area uh, using electronic uh, sensing devices, and they had written a paper and reported that there was nothing there. <laughs> so this guy said, you don't really want to dig here. You want to go over here where I've been digging, and we'll give you another shot. I said, no, we're going to dig right here, right here. And they had said it would be four to five feet down, and a whole series of things, about 150 statements that they'd made. All of them turned out to be true. It's unusual <laughs> to see somebody walk out into the middle of the desert and locate a buried building in detail and describe what's going to be there and in detail and at what depth and what culture produced it and just the whole history of this building. I mean, you can go on and get, with people who are really gifted like this, you can... Um, you can get any level of information. President Jimmy Carter was asked 
at the end of his presidency, what was the most amazing thing you saw? And he said, the most amazing thing he saw as president was a remote viewer who found an airplane that both the Americans and the Russians were looking for, and a, a man named Joe McMonigle. And, the re and as a result of that, they uh, got to the plane first, and it contained some sort of secret stuff. But I thought that was a very interesting observation of all the things you could see as president. And the other most extraordinary, uh, not most extraordinary, but other extraordinary things, is I watched a Shoshone medicine man named Rolling Thunder heal a young man of a very dangerous wound in front of me and in front of a group of about 40 doctors. And when it started, this kid had a gash. And when it was over, he had, you know when a scab comes off and it looks like shiny pink skin? Now, what I think actually happened was that Rolling Thunder stimulated this boy's own immune response and that his own body healed itself. I didn't know that for a long time. When I thought about healing originally, I coined the term about 45 years ago, subtle energies, because I was trying to think of a way to characterize this, clearly not energy in the normal sense that we mean it, so subtle energies, but I, I regret that. It was a mistake. There are no energies. This is all information. That's a, actually, I, if I can leave you with that thought, that's a, this is a very important one. It's all information. When you go on, what remains is information. When you come back, what comes back is information. Non-local consciousness is the domain of information as far as I can that's what the research is saying. It's hard to take aboard. It's hard for healers to hear because they think about, I'm sending healing. What they're doing is expressing focused intention, and they link with the recipient, and the recipient's body does the healing. We have, you have probably seen hypnosis displays where they take a, pencil and they tell people who are hypnotized it's a match and they touch their arms and a blister forms. Our capacity to control our bodies is infinitely more advanced than we realize. That's one of the main things that I have come away with in this research. Consciousness is causal, matter is manifestation, and our, the control of consciousness over matter absolute and unlimited. I started off maybe not asking in the right way, but I think it's powerful when society gets a, an image that once they're impacted by it, I don't think they can step backwards. I think that some of the recent films like What the Bleep and even now Avatar showing and giving people an, an a consciousness in a visual way of energy of the interconnectedness of the healing i think that it's no, I get your question. No. and i was pointing to it but i didn't get there that when it shows up in a film it hits a tipping point right so i was wondering if you could speak to that as one and i just now let's because just stay, i okay you want to stay there, stay stay there. Okay. Uh, i think something is going on in this country See if what I tell you agrees with your own, with your own sense of what's happening. Once you get this idea that non-local consciousness is outside space-time, time doesn't mean anything. What, it, it means something, but it doesn't mean the same thing that it does in space-time. It has a meaning, but not the same meaning. I believe a great schism is going on in the United States right now. We are all precognitively aware of the coming changes of climate change. I don't mean that we're aware in that we are consciously aware of it. It's below our conscious level. Non, the, the, the aspect of us that is non-local, that is below our normal waking consciousness. 
we have to train ourselves through one of a thousand techniques to allow it to emerge up into our conscious mind. There is a schism taking place. As we precognize, have a presentment about these coming changes, based on our own personal psychology, Everyone in America is responding in one of two ways, two broad ways. One is exclusionist, a sense of betrayal, a sense of anger, of frustration, a sense of loss, a sense of, of uh, I'm losing the world that I'm used to. And we see that in unreasoning political movements and anger and all this. And the other side of this is, again, depending on personal psychology, is inclusionist, sees opportunity, sees, well, we may go through massive changes, but we can use these changes to create something better a coming together process. So these, that's this schism which is expressed partly in politics, partly in religion, but which is broader than either of just those two categories. We, we carry this presentment. Let me describe an experiment. You'll see quite why I'm getting it. Uh, Dean Radin, who is a particularly good scientist, I have a lot of respect for, a good friend, who's down at uh, Institute of Noetic Sciences uh, down in, in uh, Northern California, did a very interesting experiment in which he ha had a camera, you know, like when you look in to do your eye, the eye exam for the, the DMV, he had a camera that was focused on the uh, eyes of the people participating and he would periodically f randomly flash pictures and two things he discovered one is that just a portion of a second before the actual picture was shown the body reacted the body reacted before the picture was displayed that's the important part and that the more emotional picture, the more numinous the picture, that is the more charged the picture, the greater the uh, change in the iris, the pupil of the eye. The more emotional, bigger the change occurring before the picture was displayed. Uh, James Spottiswood and William Browd and Ed Edwin May, other researchers, in this community have been doing experiments in which people have earphones on and just again just a portion of a second before the the sound occurs the brain responds it's a presentment effect we anticipate this because we are that part of us that is open to non-local consciousness perceives the stimulus coming before the stimulus actually comes now, if you write that in a larger context, again, individual choices produce social manifestations. If you see it in that broader context, then you can see, watch your evening news, and you can see this response. It's always anger, hate, exclusion, violence, just unhappiness. Or we can do this, it's an opportunity, whatever. Our popular culture, not surprisingly, through movies like What the Bleep or um, Men Who Stare at Goats, although that was, um, that, I, I knew all the people involved with that, and it, it didn't quite happen that way. <laughs> but in any case, or Avatar, which I think people are experiencing at a very deep mythopoetic level. I went over and saw it at the IMAX with my partner Ronlin, and the thing that struck me about it in retrospect, was that I remember it as an event, not a movie. As if I were looking out a window uh, at something going on in the yard beyond me, as it were. But 
the people who are creative, whose lives and livelihood are tied to being able to open to this. Uh, Michael Crichton, a good friend who was also a very good remote viewer in a number of my experiments, Michael attributed his success as a novelist to the fact that he had these presentments. Everybody remembers the Andromeda strain, for instance. He had just a sense of something coming, and then he constructed a story to, to express it. But people who are creatively inclined, who train themselves to be open to that creative impulse, which is the non-local impulse, are expressing for all of us this sense of presentment of another way of looking at the world and changes which are coming. Uh, this role in earlier pre-industrial times was played by mendicant poets who would remember long, complicated uh, saga poems and would be able to go and into a village or, and repeat these things which linked people together. If you look at all religious ceremonies, forget about what religion, it doesn't make any difference, you will see they have very clear commonalities. You come together in the same place. It becomes a sacred place. There is singing or chanting or drumming some form of linkage, something that links everyone who attends together. There is a statement of purposed intention, whether it's a creed or something else, there is a way of, all of this is designed to link us together so that we can open to this aspect of ourselves. And in our culture, Movies and television shows are examples of this linkage process. Think about it. You go into a dark space. You sit there like a child, your eyes up, your body relaxed and open. There's music. There's something that engages you emotionally if it's successful and you were drawn into this common experience, we are preparing for change. <coughs> That's what's going on. It's tearing us apart because we have different responses to it. But we are, in a, each in our own way, preparing for this because we recognize we hold the seeds of this in our consciousness. 